Hi friends, welcome to the garden in our backyard. Today is September 3rd of 2017. Our garden space measures 40 feet by 40 feet or 1600 square feet. And I like to tell people how big it is because it's similar in size to many people's front or backyards where they have the opportunity to grow food instead of lawns. We call this happy space Rancho Rizo and it serves as a sort of sanctuary for both our soul and our bodies. Life's busy pace slows down here and aligns closer with the rhythm of nature, so I invite you to kick back, relax, and enjoy. And it looks like Charlotte and Alice our two African pygmy goats are ready to start their day. So we keep them locked up in here at night and when we're not around, so they're safe from predators. All right, girls, who's ready to start their day? Hi, Mama. I hear the hens in the background. Should we go say hi to them too? Go see what they're up to. Hi ladies. We'll come and say hello in just a minute. Animals have a profound influence on the collective soul of a garden or farm, and we really love their company. Mm, big stretch. Hey girls. In the mornings, we like to peek into the chicken enclosure and see if they've left us any gifts. And today, they've left us a few. Thank you. The early morning hours here in the garden are peaceful but in the background we can hear the hustle and bustle of people starting their day. In addition to our goats and chickens, a large community of creatures lives in and around the garden. So tending to this space is a bit like being a conductor in an orchestra where every player can improvise at any time. We built this little greenhouse last winter out of reclaimed wood. To insulate it, we wrapped it in a six millimeter clear plastic film, which has since succumbed to the elements. So we're looking for some reclaimed windows. But for summer and early fall, it's fine open air. Here I'm watering the seedling starts that we'll be planting in fall, including cabbages, broccolis, cauliflowers, and Brussels sprouts. When the starts need to harden off, I put them here on the propagation table. But for now, we have some potted pepper plants and holy basils, which I water every day. For the afternoon segment of this video, I'll give you a tour of every portion of this garden, but for right now I'm going to tend to those plants that need attention. During the Summer of Love 1967, at UC Santa Cruz, the master gardener Alan Chadwick tended to a beautiful space, and he's quoted as saying that a good gardener looks at every plant every day. In our garden, on this morning, I tend to holy basil, or tulsi, and in particular the variety here is called kapur. Tulsi is considered the queen of all medicinal herbs in Ayurvedic medicine. Disease resistance and with a beautiful fragrance, she thrives in our garden. We pick these flowering tops 
which bees frequently come to visit, under the watchful eye of other inhabitants in this space. The green Tulsi Kapoor is starting to crowd out its neighbor, the purple Tulsi Krishna, so I have to make room for everybody to grow. Because the Krishna strain is slower growing and harder to propagate, I've let some flower tops develop, and here I'm checking to see if they're ready to harvest for seed, and then I'll enjoy that aromatic fragrance. Sometimes we put fresh Tulsi in our drinking water, but the majority gets dried out in shelves we have here against our shed. I also dry herbs, flowers, and peppers here in our shed, and here's a finished, completely dry batch of Tulsi, which we'll bring back into the house. This is Clemson okra, and I'm going to harvest some morning vegetables that'll be part of my breakfast as the sun starts to rise high in the sky. It's time to start wrapping things up out here. This is a baby golden zucchini with the blossom still attached. And this is a cubanelle pepper for just a teeny bit of spicy kick. little appetizer before breakfast. Since I'm snacking, I grab a few cherry tomatoes, and it gives me a chance to look at this portion of our garden. I used to grow tomatoes giving every plant lots of room to grow, but for about a year I've been volunteering once a week at a farm in Malibu, and I watched how they planted their tomatoes in rows about a foot apart, and then they would string the tomatoes up to keep them supported. So that's what I'm doing here. Of course, under the watchful eye of those that live here. As I start to wrap up here in the garden this morning, I'll collect all of the trimmings and green material that I cut away. These greens are rich in nitrogen and go onto my compost pile. I'll then cover it up with some brown material, which is heavier in carbon. It'll aid in the decomposition, and ultimately this compost will be returned back to the garden. Come and get it, come and get it, come and get it, come and get it. It's time to return the girls back to the safety of their enclosure and I entice them with some corn chips, which might help to explain their full figures. Truth is, this is an occasional treat for them, and they mostly eat grasses and grains. Back in the air-conditioned comfort of the home, I'll put some of the dried Tulsi into a stainless steel tea ball to prepare a kettle of tea. The peace, tranquility, and exercise you get from working in a garden would make it worthwhile unto itself. But of course, the healthy foods that we harvest are an enormous benefit. I'm deeply concerned about rampant deception that occurs in our current food system. They pitch things as healthy, but in fact they're not. And I have an equally large concern for the welfare of animals that are caught up in industrial agriculture. So for these reasons, and many more, I find it very gratifying to grow food and share with my family and others around me. A garden nourishes the soul and the body. But you don't have to have 
a large space to grow food. If you're in an apartment and have a balcony, you can grow plants in pots or on a window sill and therefore get attached to the food that you're eating. Modern day philosopher and winning basketball coach from UCLA, John Wooden would say, don't let what you can't do stop you from doing that which you can do. With my animals tended to and morning chores accomplished, I'm ready to start a productive day. Alice and Charlotte know that when they're let out of their enclosure to come here to this bucket for some treats because inside there are vegetable and fruit scraps, eggshells and coffee grinds, all of which will end up in our compost pile, but they get first shot. So it's afternoon now, so why don't I walk you around, we'll take a look and I'll tell you about all the varieties that we're growing and then in a little bit go ahead and do those afternoon chores. Okay, let's take a look around. In the farthest west corner I have both a volunteer palm and a dahlia which hasn't yet started to put up its flowers. But of course it's tomatoes that dominate this quadrant. The varieties that I have in the weld wire cages I bought in an event called Tomato Mania and put them in the ground all the way back in May. And all the tomatoes that I have in these three rows, I started from seeds. I gave my neighbor some of my extra starts, so the same plants, just a few hundred yards away, have been producing all summer, where mine look like they're just starting to come into production. I suspect it's the fact that their garden gets a few more hours of sunlight every day. We water our tomatoes infrequently, letting the ground dry out before giving them a thorough soaking about once a week. Here in the northern portion of our garden, we're growing some pole beans, and in particular these are arid adapted varieties indigenous to the southwest that we got from the native seed search. In fall, these vines will start putting up flowers, and when pollinated, pods will develop with the beans inside, which will let dry on the vine. Once dried, we'll harvest and shell them, and they'll be enjoyed throughout winter and store easily. In these two rows, we're trying to grow some cucumbers, but this year we faced some challenges. Our first planting in mid-May was a favorite treat for the small birds, which is why we now have the netting. Normally by this time of year, we'd be well into our pickle production process, but we're still hoping for a fall crop. In this back row of the east quadrant, we're growing squashes like yellow crookneck, yellow zucchini, and green zucchini, and okra, including the varieties burgundy and clemson. Aphids have proven to be a challenge here, and while ants take care of some of them, we do occasionally spray organic neem oil. The majority of this quadrant is dominated by the pepper patch, over 80 plants, and it's the sweet peppers and medium heat that are really in production at the moment. But tucked between the rows of squash and okra and the peppers, is a row of chard, both red and white, which have suffered from the heat wave that we're just coming out of. Here in the south quadrant, our eggplant variety, Rosa Bianca, looks like it's taken a bit of a hit from the heat. But it's the ground squirrels that have kept me from most of this harvest, and the garden teaches us we have to share. Over here I have one eggplant of the variety, Casper, which the ground squirrel doesn't seem to like quite as much. 
We have one Tulsi Vana here, but the rest of these plants are bush beans. The varieties are Pencil Pod Golden Wax and Provider, and they haven't yet started to produce their beans, which we'll enjoy during the fall. And in the back row, closest to the corn, I have some German chamomile, which I harvested yesterday, and some sweet basil. In these four rows, we've done what Native Americans referred to as a three sisters planting. The three sisters consist of corn, pole beans, and squash. And they have a relationship where they help one another thrive. The corn grows tall and the pole beans rise up and wrap around the corn, helping them in strong winds. Here you can see I'm facing an aphid challenge on some of the early corns that are just starting to tassel. The ants here are eating the aphids, and if you look closely on this corn leaf, you can see a praying mantis, whom is also a beneficial insect to the garden. So I'll watch this challenge closely and find out if nature will find its balance, or if I, as the conductor of this orchestra, need to intervene with some organic assistance. My first choice would be to introduce some ladybugs to the mix, and from there we might use some organic neem oil. I use the same varieties of pole beans here that we did in the north quadrant on the trellis. Pole beans fix nitrogen into the soil and corn is a heavy nitrogen feeder. The squash, which are delicata, spaghetti, and pumpkin, act as a living mulch, which shade out weeds that would otherwise be growing on the ground. Companion planting helps all crops, and there are other sisters that people sometimes include, such as amaranth or sunflowers. I look forward to seeing how this grouping does going into the fall. As the afternoon transitions into early evening, I want to harvest some of the peppers that have fully ripened. Most of the sweet peppers ripen early, so we've been enjoying bells, shishitos, and violet sparkles throughout the summer. But with summer winding down, now some of the hotter peppers are starting to ripen. In this patch I've found plenty of evidence that rodents enjoy the peppers as much as we do. Ancho Poblano times jalapeno. But the rats or mice don't seem to be as enthusiastic about eating the hot peppers, so there's a bigger harvest for me in those. And with this crop, We'll make salsa, hot sauce, and a dry powder I like to call Tears in the Bathroom. With about 85 different pepper plants, consisting of about 30 different varieties, I keep a journal so I know what I planted where. We save the seeds from all of our best crops for a variety of reasons. And when it comes to saving seeds from hot pepper plants, I strongly advise that you wear some gloves. The oil that gives hot peppers their heat is called capsaicin, and if you get that on your fingers and then end up scratching your nose or eyes, or worse yet, if you itch yourself somewhere where the sun doesn't shine, well, you'll never make that mistake twice. Saving seeds from crops you like makes the next generation more hardy because they genetically adapt to the weather and the soil in your particular area. So this is the red Savina habanero. And truthfully, even the seeds look nasty here. Everything's kind of crinkly. And now that I'm in the hundreds of thousands of Scoville, you can smell it. Where the other peppers were, you know, tens of thousands of Scoville, Scoville, pardon me. These are now in the hundreds of thousands. And they are a uh, different beast. By saving seeds, you also save money 
because you don't have to buy them from one year to the next. There are a lot of great community-based seed swaps. So if you save seeds, you can share them with your neighbors and friends, and they, in turn, will probably introduce you to some crops that you'll enjoy that are adapted to your area. Caring for the welfare of animals is a big responsibility, and we believe that our animals should feel like they won the karma lottery. So before everybody goes to bed at night, we make sure that their space is clean. About once a week, we'll remove all the bedding of their enclosures, but every day or so we like to clean out those areas where they tend to go poop and pee. So after removing the old bedding, we'll add fresh wood chips or straw. Same concept holds true for their food. We'll take out any old food and put in, for the goats, fresh orchard grass or alfalfa. Interestingly, goats are very picky about water and want it freshly filled every day. So we oblige and, of course, do the same for our hens. We treat our animals well and in turn, they treat us well. This whole afternoon ritual we call getting our animals fed and in bed. And here our hens not only get fresh organic grain, but they also share in the compost bounty. In addition to food scraps and grain, we regularly bring our hens a wheelbarrow full of half composted material for them to scratch and search through, looking for bugs and other foods. Over time, this deep bedding accumulates their feathers and poops, and of course that becomes a rich source of nutrients for our compost piles. So into our compost pile go the kitchen scraps that neither the goats or the chickens wanted. And now all the goat and chicken bedding gets added to the compost pile, covering up the food scraps. With the right amount of moisture and turning this pile every few months, it'll heat up, break down into nutrient-rich soil, which will return to the garden. Most of us say we care about the environment, but the food that you buy and eat arguably has some of the largest impact, not only on your health, but on the health of our planet. Maybe you can turn your lawn into a garden, or put one raised bed in your yard, or one pot on your balcony, or shop at a farmer's market, or only buy organic foods, or foods that are certified animal welfare safe. So like Coach John Wooden would say, don't let what you can't do stop you from doing what you can. Thank you, my friends, for watching this video. I hope you learned something, I hope you were inspired, and I hope you enjoyed. Most of all, I wish you a long, happy, and healthy life.